today we've been studying through the book of Genesis. We've been studying through um, the Bible and um, going one verse at a time, one chapter at a time. Uh, I've never known anybody to do it this way, and uh, the Lord just put it on my heart to do it. Don't know how far I'll get and don't know how uh, in-depth I'll go, but um, as I do my studies, uh, I just keep going right along. And so we'll keep going right along, amen? And uh, we're in Genesis chapter 3. We talked about Satan last time. And Satan's come up before. We've talked about evil, and we talked about Satan and how subtle he can be. Um, Satan doesn't come at you with pitchforks and flaming torches, and he doesn't come at you looking like the enemy. He comes at you very well disguised, as well disguised as he can be, to lure, seduce, to trick you, uh, and to deceive you. He's called the deceiver, and he's called subtle. And there's subtle people in this world, and people that are um, subtle, they come on to be nice, gen you know, gentle and all this, and then they do that to try to destroy you. And they work after Satan, because that's how Satan is. And I brought that Bible study because um, God's children can many times be very uh, naive of the devil. And the Apostle Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices. You don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices because he's a wise individual. Uh, he's evil, but he's a wiser than Daniel, the Bible says, a wiser than Daniel. And so Satan is wise, and he's going to try to destroy the work of the Lord. Uh, he's doing a pretty good job at it in places, and uh, he's going to try to um, undermine anything that's godly. And he's going to do it looking like it's good. And we talked about the power of positive thinking. And what you've got in this society today is you've got a trick of the devil through positive thinking. And the first thing that came out of the devil's mouth, the first word that came out of the devil's mouth when he tried to tempt Eve was yea. Yea is a positive word. You want to know what this society is built on? is super positivism. And it's a lure of the devil to try to coesce and try to destroy and try to undermine and try to get rid of the negative preaching that needs to come across pulpits. And people can't handle negative preaching. And you take somebody like uh, Jonah who has to go in and preach to Nineveh. He says, 40 days and yet Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days and Nineveh shall be blown off the map. Where's the, where's the burden of, of uh, lost people? Let me ask you something. What church invited him in? What mission board invited Jonah in? Where was, where was the chance for anybody to even get saved? There wasn't any. And biblical preaching in America, in America today, preaching is not like biblical preaching at all. And uh, because preaching that comes across the pulpit, real preaching is going to be negative at times. And the fact of the matter is, your heart condition will be attuned to how well you can adjust and how well you can uh, listen to negative preaching. And most people today, and that's why Bible-believing churches are empty, that's why Bible-believing churches are, are uh, dwindling, is because they can't handle negative preaching. And uh, it's negative preaching for positive results. And most of the Bible is negative. Preach against sin. It says exhort, but it says reprove and rebuke. We want the exhortation, but we don't really want the reproving and the rebuking. Amen? No flesh would. No flesh would. If you would, let's go to Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, there it is, yea, Hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch, touch it, lest you die. You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for saving us, for dying on Calvary's cross. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this church. Lord, we pray that we would uh, be edified this morning, that we would be instructed in righteousness. Lord, we pray that we give you the, uh, in all things, we give you the honor, the praise, and the glory that's due unto your name. And Lord, we pray that you'd uh, visit among us, Lord, where two or three are gathered. In Jesus' name we do, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the garden of Eden was made up of trees. 
and trees, uh, they, they represent certain things in the Bible. Trees represent certain things. Trees are likened unto men. Trees are likened unto men. Now in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, it talks about this. Now the ground, the Lord God, uh, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good, of good and evil. So you have in the Garden of Eden, you have many trees. You have, I don't know, apple trees, pear trees. It says the tree of the vine, which would be, you know, grapes. It was called the tree of the vine. And uh, all these different trees. And then there was two particular ones that God mentioned, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's interesting because when Adam and Eve sin, they go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil while surpassing the tree of life. God told them the one tree they couldn't go to was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They had all the other trees in the garden, which are probably a lot of trees. And they had the tree of life. And what does man do? Goes right by the tree of life, right to the forbidden tree. That's man, rebellious. <laughs> rebellious at the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they're forbidden to eat of the tree of life. And you got a chariot of uh, a chariot. You got a cherubim that guards that tree of life. And God says, lest man should also eat the tree of life. And so then a man eats the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, goes by the tree of life, and that tree of life is is forbidden from them. The trees are likened. Um, Trees are likened unto men. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 24. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up, and said, I see men as trees walking. So this blind man, he was blind from birth, and Jesus comes over and heals the blind man and, and uh, gives him back his sight. But at first, when he heals the blind man, the blind, the blind man says, I see men as trees walking, which is an interesting uh, uh, passage of Scripture. Men are likened unto trees. Judges chapter 9, verse 7, trees um, have qualities of men, they talk to one another and reign over one another in this parable. Judges chapter 9, verse 7. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of uh, Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith um, by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees. Verse 10, And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go and be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my vine, my wine, which uh, cheereth God and man, to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees to the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely, and that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt with, well with Jerubbabel and his house, and have done unto him according to to the deserving of his hands. So we have in this passage a king that's come to power, a king that they're trying to get rid of in Israel, and they're likening these kings under trees. And these kings want power, they want authority, they want, to be, uh, they want to be king, they want to be in control. And notice how they're likened under trees. Notice the trees are given human traits in this parable, in this passage. All right, these aren't literal trees that are going out and talking. But they're likened, men are likened unto trees. The trees are given human traits such as conversating and ruling. Right, it says, come thou and reign 
over us. All right, so trees in the Bible have meaning. Uh, things in the Bible, God uses types and pictures in the Bible and the Word of God to bring across truths. When Christ talks about mankind, he uses trees. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now this is a really good passage for uh, Christians, and it's a really good devotional uh, that many of you probably have read and have gone through. But this devotional that Christ's talking about, he uses trees and uses husbandry uh, as examples. Of course, back then, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jews, they were husbandmen. They were uh, tillers of the ground. They were farmers. They were um, people that kept uh, crops. And so the Lord uses trees. Some trees represent good people and good uh, fruit, and others represent evil people that bear evil fruit. All right, so trees represent people, and some people do good things, and some people do bad things, amen? And uh, Jesus Christ says here in Matthew chapter 7, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth, what? Evil fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is what? Hewn down and cast in the fire. So that's a type of a lost person that's without Christ that dies and goes to hell. That's also a type of a Christian who doesn't live a fruitful life. So there's a lot of types in that passage of Scripture. Then Christ talks about men, he uses trees. So trees are a type of men. And of course, you study the Scriptures, he, Jesus Christ goes up to a fig tree and he doesn't get any figs from it. And he curses that tree. And that tree never brings forth fruit again. The Garden of Eden was made up of many trees. And we looked at it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. He, the Lord God formed every tree. There are special trees in the millennium. And there's going to be special trees in the eternity future that are going to do different things. Oop, I'm getting ahead of myself. Another verse. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. If you have bad fruit, if fruit is a representation of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, love, joy peace, long-suffering, faith, goodness, meekness, temperance, and if you're not showing forth those things or you're showing forth bad works, the Bible says you're a bad tree. Let a good tree bring forth good fruit. Let a bad tree... Be, you want to know what people... They want to act good and then bring forth bad fruit. A tree is known by its fruits. Talk about mankind. If you're saved, you should be uh, saved and you should be doing good. Have good fruits. There are special trees in the millennium. Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 7. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river, there were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Verse 12. And, upon, and by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat. So trees are for fruit. They're for food. And it shows you that right there in the passage. Whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Man is likened unto trees. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 1, a man that's following God shall be like a tree, what? Planted by the rivers of water. It shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the unrighteous are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. So you're likened unto a tree. Man is likened unto a tree. 
the millennium, there's these special trees. In the uh, eternity future, you want to know something? There's going to come a day where uh, heaven and earth will pass away. There's going to be a new heaven, new earth, a new Jerusalem. The mother of us all, it says in Hebrews, is going to come down out of the sky. Isn't that going to be a sight to see? That's going to be better than any movie, than any television show. And then there's going to be these trees coming out of this river of water. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Man, isn't that something to see? How many of you have seen crystal clear water? Some may have never seen crystal clear water. The water that's going to come out of the throne of God is going to be crystal clear. No contaminants, no pollution, serene, beautiful. The Bible says that he hath made everything beautiful in his time. You want to know what? The Lord makes everything beautiful. It's sin that corrupts it and destroys it. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Remember that tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden? That man couldn't eat of because he was in rebellion? He went and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? There's a lesson there. Man always wants knowledge. Man always wants knowledge and facts and accumulation of facts. You want to know what our society is marked by? That. Accumulation of facts. And yet we go by the tree of life. Think about that. Pray about that. That's a message right in and of itself. Man always goes by the, what he needs to, and gets what he wants. And today, you have all this knowledge and you have no life. And of course, the life comes from Christ. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But man, he'd rather have his, he'd rather have his knowledge. Give me my information. And people are full of it today, and that's why people, it's hard for people to get saved. Uh, the Bible says pride shall bring a man low, and men are filled with pride, and women are filled with pride, because we know so much, we think we know so much. Now we're at the age of, we're past the age of computers, now we're in the nano age, and we just got all this stuff, and we're just so smart and so intelligent, but we're very stupid. We go by Jesus Christ. That's pretty stupid, folks. You're going to damn your soul to hell so you can get some information, get some knowledge, get some wealth. That's pretty stupid. That's pretty unwise. And so, by getting knowledge, we actually lack wisdom. Anyways, here in the age of ages, in the eternity future, we're going to have trees that are going to be special trees. And these trees, they're special. And they're going to do something. Uh, these trees have healing power. You know, I know something what people want is they want healing power. People get sick, people get diseases, loved ones get cancers, and loved ones get uh, terminal illnesses. We want them to live. We want ourselves to live. We want to live forever. Uh, the answer is Jesus Christ. Amen. The answer is Jesus. You want to live forever? You want eternal life? The answer is Jesus Christ. And of course, physically, everybody will die unless the Lord returns, and we want healing power. And these trees are going to actually provide healing power in the millennium and in the age of ages. And, I show, and it showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing. Some people want healing. Some people want restoration. Some people want um, their loved ones to not suffer anymore. They don't want themselves to suffer anymore. People are going to die. People are dying all over the world today. As, we, as I preach and teach this message, people are dying. See, that's a pretty grim thing. That's the truth. People want to heal. And the Lord's got the healing power, but it's in Him. And, and the, these trees are going to actually bear... Healing power. Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 12. And by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit. God always makes things new. According to his months, because their waters, they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf, therefore, for 
Anyone want to know something? Is we, uh, we live in a medicine society today. We have medicine for a lot of things that can cure and treat a lot of things. And these trees, they're going to walk right up to these trees in New Jerusalem. They're going to pluck the fruit and they have the leaves right there. And those leaves are going to, the person will be bleeding or a person will be dying. A person will be uh, on the verge of death and that leaf and that tree is going to heal them. And they're not going to die. They might have some sort of disease that's destroying their flesh. And they're going to touch that leaf and they're going to have access to the tree of life, these people in New Jerusalem. And they're not going to die. And they're going to be healed. And that's what's going to happen. And these trees are special trees that the Lord's set up. And it's going to put any thought of death and any thought of discomfort and anguish aside. You know, we get caught up in the future and we talk about these verses and we talk about Ezekiel and, and Revelations, and this is, ah, this is in the future, these special trees that are going to have healing power in their leaves. But you want to know something? Is this Bible has got advanced scientific revelation? And we go right over it. We think about these verses, we think about the future, but these verses are actually practically now. You say, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. Percy Lavone Julian is a scientist. He was a well-known chemist. And he was one of the first to pioneer synthesizing medicine from trees and from plants. We get caught up in the future, but today we have a lot of medicines that we use to treat people and to even cure some cancers that would normally kill people. You know where we get them from? We get them from plants. We get them from trees. Ezekiel and Revelation isn't just applying about the future. Now, that might be supernatural, but there's some scientific advanced revelation of the Bible for today. But you've got to believe it. People don't believe God's Word. Trees and plants were used, are used for healing and medicine today. And uh, Percy Lavone Julian was born in April 1899 and died April 19th, 1975. He was an American research chemist and pioneer in the chemical synthesis of medicine drugs from plants. He synthesized some of the uh, progesterone and testosterone from plants, uh, steroids such as uh, stigmin masterol. And these, of course, are um, uh, inside of our bodies. These are hormones. Julian received more than 130 chemical patents. He was the first African-American to receive a doctorate in chemistry. And so these plants are used today. They're used today for drugs. They're used today for medicine. And uh, the drug anabicin or anabicin comes from the anabasis um, syphila, syphila, I believe, which is a skeletal muscle relaxant, along with uh, sysomel... Sisimpelanine, Sisimpelanine, I believe it is, which comes from Sisimpedos pararia. Borneo is found in many plants, and this is an anti-inflammatory. A lot of the stuff we use today over the counter, a lot of the stuff we use today to, for um, our, our pains, aches and pains, are used from these plants. Lipocol is an anti-cancer, anti-tumor drug. Thymol comes from thymus vulgaris, is an antifungal. There's anti-cancer drugs. A lot of these drugs, a lot of these medicines have cured and treated a lot of very dangerous cancers. Taxol, all right, which is, uh, comes from the Pacific yew tree. Taxus brevifolia is one of the first choices in cancer research, in, in, in uh, cancer um, uh, medicines used in chemotherapy, docetaxel, paclit I think it's paclitexel. Some of these are hard to pronounce. Vinblastine and vincentine are anti-leukemia drugs. And these, uh, some of these trees are these. Uh, the the vinblastine. Is a Madagascar periwinkle tree. Uh, Tepotican is the descent of the ancient of some of the Chinese trees. Camp uh, Camptotheica 
and this treats ovarian cancer and small lung cancers. And of course, this one's currently in clinical trials, so they're still testing it out so that it gets passed by the FDA. You have other drugs, Podophelum, and uh, others are, uh, Podophelum is a, is a chemotherapy drug. Tenoposita is derived from toxins in the Podophelum pellitum, which is mayapple, mayapple trees. A lot of these trees have very important drugs that people use for uh, curing cancers. This is bitter melon juice. Bitter melon juice is a plant which grows predominantly in Asia and Africa and the Caribbean, used in diabetes treatment. It has lately been targeted. Now, this was used for diabetes treatment, treatment, but now this has been recently targeted for pancreatic cancer. What do you know about pancreatic cancer? Not very treatable. You get pancreatic cancer, usually they find out it's too late and you're going to die soon. And they're targeting this drug synthesized from this plant right here, this melon, this bitter melon juice. Been lately targeted for pancreatic cancer treatment. God's word is real and God's word is true. It talks about the healing, these trees are for the healing of the nations and of course we always refer it, in, in doctrinally it does refer to the millennium and, for, and to the age of ages, but there's a healing power in these trees now and scientists are studying this out. In a study in the University of Colorado, Bill and Mel bitter melon fruit showed a positive destruction of pancreatic cancer cells in vitro of mice. BMJ, bitter melon juice, inhibits uh, prolification inducing um, apoptosis and activating um, AMPK. So these, they've targeted these that the drug from this bitter melon juice can may be the next cure or treatment for pancreatic cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer is highly untreatable and detectable. It's usually detected too late. Traditional treatments such as radiation and chemotherapy have proved over and over to be ineffective. <clears throat> so these trees, there's healing in them. And you, where do you get that from? God's word. God shows you all. Years before all this, now we're getting the science now. We're understanding the science. We're, we're understanding how to synthesize uh, chemicals now than we have in the last you know, 20, 30 years, 40 years. But this stuff was in God's word way beforehand. And people thought it was, and it's how mankind is. We all think, well, that's talking about the future. These trees are for the healing of the nations. And I believe that in the future there's going to be supernatural healing from these trees, but there's natural healing today from God's Word showing you. Now, it's interesting because there may be more than one tree of life in the millennium in, the, in, in eternity. And the reason why I say that is because of this. In Ezekiel 47, look down here. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river. Now this is talking about the millennium. When I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees, all right, very many trees. Now the traditional teaching is that there's one tree of life in eternity and in the millennium. And I, I believe through study of scripture that there might be three trees of life. In Ezekiel 47, 12, it says, and by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow all trees. Notice it's plural, it's not singular. And I know there's many trees in the garden, but there was only one tree of life. Uh, and we'll get to that. But if you look down here, it says trees, plural. And it says, by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for me. Plural. Now go, if you would, to Revelation 22. This is talking about the uh, eternity. This is talking about eternity. This is talking about the age of ages. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now watch this. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the what? Now tree of life is brought to you singular, but notice how it's located. It's located in three different positions. In the midst of the street, 
and on either side. That's three different locations. That means a tree of life has three, either three different locations and it sprouts out like a root sprout or it's three different trees. I believe it might be three different trees. It could be actually one tree that sprouts three different ways. You know, there's trees that do that. They have root sprouts. And they sprout up in multiple places. But I've, this is, I've never heard anybody teach on that. I think it's pretty interesting. Now, we know that there was only one tree of life in the garden. That's why the traditional thought is that there was only one tree of life in eternity. Uh, and we know this from Genesis 2.9. And out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life. All right? Singular. So in the garden there was only one tree of life. And there's a back reference to Genesis 3.17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of what? It. All right, so that tree of life is singular in the garden. But I think there might be more than one tree of life in, the, in eternity. There might not be. There might just be one. But I think it's something that's interesting to look into. Trees were worshipped uh, in the pagan gods of before. And in ancient cultures, uh, trees were worshipped uh, with superstition. Uh, let's see. European tree worship... It was called animism. It is perhaps one of the most ancient forms of religion. In Europe, one of the remnants of the ancient religion can be seen in the reverence worship of trees. The Celts had their own cult of trees, adopted from local cults. Trees and groves, they would hang up trees and they would grow them in uh, dark groves. Uh, and then they would have offerings, usually the heads of victims. Look at how cruel these pagan people are. And of course, they would try to appease the spirits, especially over the spirits of vegetation. They wanted good crops, so they would appease the gods, and they would cut people's heads off and hang them on trees. The mistletoe was revered as one of the most influential uh, trees of these gods, of these um, Celts. The mistletoe was revered as one of the most choice woods of worship. And so the oak tree... If you study your Bible, the oak tree is, uh, you see that in ancient Israel, they started worshiping trees. So history of the oak tree. Uh, the oldest sanctuaries in Europe were woods. The German means war man. The word Teutonic comes from uh, deut deutahonic, or douche. These people taught that if the bark was peeled from a tree from a sacred grove, the, cr the criminal was to have his navel nailed to a tree and he was whipped around it till he was dead. Notice how cruel these pagans are. The fig tree was sacred to Romulus. The tree roots were smeared with blood or cut down or blown away. Austrian and upper Palatine cutters asked the tree for forgiveness before cutting it down. The Germans made a cross on a tree before felling it so a spirit could still live in it. A tree spirit was res responsible for sun, rain, and growth of crops. The maypole made cattle and women fertile. May Day is a Werplugus night. When little May Rose goes door to door carrying a small May tree to get gifts. In Francis, this is Father May, the same as Green George. In the Slavic nations uh, and green leaves in England. In Holland, it's the sunflower or little girl in a wagon. In Thuringia, it is a little leaf man. In Hesia, little uh, Wincentine man. And of course, there's many different ones. The female, May Queen, is in France and England, and uh, Schuttensen, Lysenen in Germany. The queen of the May Hunt is Diana, goddess of the woodlands. To get crops to grow, the Roman College of Twelve Priests offered sacrifices in a grove five miles down the uh, Tiber River from Rome. The Greek Artemis was also a patron goddess of cattle, herdsmen, and physical life. Hunters crowned hunting dogs at Diana's festival. She was supposed to hear the prayers of women in travail. Uh, in a grove, a woman could conceive a virgin birth by a god, lowercase g. Monarchs in Egypt came through this female line. No one knew who their father was. It was said she who was joined to Ammon 
She shall reign in righteousness in all the earth. One prayer to her said, My soul is hers, my heart is hers, my will is hers, my crown is hers, that she may guide the souls of the living. Notice how dedicated they are. Thebes was governed by female popes. Maidens were appointed to serve Ammon as concubines. Now, you know Ammon in the Bible. Now, a story with Ammon and Tamar. That was a story of wickedness. As concubines of the virgin god Pallas, none were virgins, they were uh, temple prostitutes. They became public harlots after years of fornication in seminaries with priests. This calling to be a prostitute began at the age 12. Now you're getting incest and you're getting uh, um, fornication going on, all, all wickedness. In Dahomey, West Africa, every fourth woman was a religious prostitute. They were married to a god, so he caused uh, the excesses. Very wicked. Every Greek king was called Zeus. The Roman kings impersonated Jupiter. Jupiter was the oak god, hence the laurel wreath was a crown of oak leaves. Jupiter, Baal, controlled lightning and uh, ever-burning flame for him. Jupiter was connected with electromagnetic forces. Both Greeks and Italians associated Zeus and Jupiter and thunder with thunderstorms. Notice how it's all getting tied in with the false gods. Lithuanians and Swedes held that their oaks in a particular grove were sacred. Buddhist monks ascribed souls to trees, the Dyaks. The Chinese said some spirits of trees are serpents or bulls. Mistletoe growing, there it is. The Celts were big on mistletoe, so that Christmas chime with mistletoe hanging over, yeah, it's pagan. It's pagan. It comes from this tree worship. Mistletoe growing on an oak made it sacred to the Druids, the oakmen. The Slavs' thunder god was Terra, called Old Father, Father of Heaven. The prayer to him was, Dear Thunder, we sacrifice an ox to thee. Holy thunder, guard our fields. The Indian god of thunder was Parjanya. He gave fertile cattle. He was the son of heaven, Haino, was the thunder god of the Iroquois, and the Andes Indian thunder god was Wykon, whose bird was the condor. A Greek Orthodox priest in 1840 was an eyewitness in Livonia, Russia, to a drunken uh, party, which began with a priest putting incense on a giant oak tree and the people bowing down to it. They prayed, Holy Oak, hallelujah, pray for us. Now you laugh at that and you think how goofy and stupid that these people do that. They're that, they're that um, uh, superstitious. Imitating lightning from heaven was produced by rubbing two token sticks together. Vesta was another name for Venus, Diana, and Artemis. The male peg went into the female hole on a fireboard and was rotated rapidly to produce the eternal flame. And it says, a woman was held, the pegboard, a man twirled the stick, fire went on the wreath of a king, went out, its keeper was strangled when the king died. If the reader, and so on and so forth. And so that's how that pagan culture came into, came into existence. In Jeremiah chapter 17, Notice the verse here says the sin of Judah. Now Judah is the house of God. And notice what the house of God goes to. Notice the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. Wits their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. Judah, the house of God, was going to paganism, was going to tree worship, was going to the worship of the trees. Now, you say, how did, they, how did the house of God, the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, how did uh, um, Judah get so far? Well, it started in Israel. And if you know the history of Israel, Israel had, had a, um, had a um, uh, breaking apart. They had a civil war. And you had the ten northern tribes, and then you had Judah and Benjamin below. And the ten northern tribes were called Israel and Benj Benjamin and Judah were called Judah, and they split apart from each other after the reign of Solomon. And Judah stayed with the Lord for a little while. They went after the, uh, David and, and served the Lord God as David served him, but their hearts weren't as perfect as David's heart. And the people in the northern tribes went right away from God. They went to the sins of Jeroboam. 
And Jeroboam, after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam caused the split of the kingdom, caused the ten northern tribes to split from the two southern tribes. And Jeroboam takes the ten northern tribes, and Rehoboam takes the two southern tribes, and the, two, and the ten northern tribes are called the tribes of Israel. Uh, they reign, the king of Israel would reign from Samaria, while the king of Judah reigned from Jerusalem. And so Israel goes into idolatry pretty quick. Look here in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 1. In the seventh year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, did that which... And did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father, but he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. All right? And the kings of Israel were going to paganism, they were going away from God. And made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen. So they would kill their young ones, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills under every green tree. So they were adopting this tree worship, this paganistic tree worship, of, and it's devil, it's devil worship. And of course, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 19, And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof, I have roasted flesh and eaten it. Shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? And now what you have today in America is you have religions that are bowing down to idols, images. In America and around the world, that tree worship has now changed into idolatry. It's been idolatry, now it changes. Instead of bowing down to a whole tree, they bow down to part of a tree. And they fashion it, and they mold it, and they cut it, and they make it into some image whether it's an image of a man or an image of a beast or an image of a, of a saint. And you know the Bible says in uh, the Ten Commandments in Exodus, you're not to make any graven image of anything that is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath or the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not make anything like unto it. So that means you're not to make an image of Saint Jude or, or you're not to make an image of Jesus Christ. You're not to make an image of things in heaven above. You're not to make images of fish and, and man and four-footed beast, things in the earth or things under the earth. Idolatry is a direct contradiction and a direct violation of God's moral and holy and righteous laws. And of course, in the New Testament, Paul says that you sacrifice things unto idols, and that blood of that sacrifice is wicked. So tree worship has stemmed from even before ancient Europe. And Europe took it right from here, and Israel adopted it. Remember, Israel, Israel was in the northern tribes, and Judah was the southern tribes, and Judah started taking on idolatry. Spiritually speaking, church, you've got to be careful not to be taking on the things of this world, and the world's ways, the world's systems, the world's thinking, the world's ideologies, because you're going to go downward. That's what Judah did. Judah went downward when Judah took on what Israel. Israel was still part of the commonwealth. Look, folks, the way it works is the lost heathens are outside the doors, and the lost heathens were invited into Israel, which is a type of a backslidden Christian, and then the sins of Israel got to the sins of Judah, and Judah is a type of a serving Christian. The state of apostasy goes from the world to the backsliding Christian to the serving Christian. And that's what's happening. That's what happened to Judah, and that's what's happening to American Christians today. Christians today, I'm going to talk about the serving Christians, the ones that are soul winning. Soul winning. The ones that are witnessing are the ones that are starting to be, be led astray and be like the world and be tainted and, and to be uh, uh, brought down. And this rot that's occurring has is, is been occurring for years. And you better watch it. You better be careful. Because uh, the spiritual wickedness is it's in high places and it's, gonna in, it's infiltrating the church, the church of God. 
Are there any questions on anything that I taught? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you've given to me. I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you bless the message to come. We thank you for all these things, and in Jesus' name we do pray.